Hi, I'm Albert Carnicelli, acting dean of the Kennedy School. And one of the nice things about uh, sitting in the dean's chair is that the school has to be nice to you and nice to your family and nice to your friends. So, uh, so I got to invite my hometown mayor to speak to you tonight. Um, New York and Harvard actually have a great deal in common in that the inhabitants of each believe that they are at the center of the universe. The mayor probably believes that uh, Manhattan is at the center. Uh, he can't possibly be right. If the center of the universe is not at the Kennedy School, then it must be in the Bronx. Uh, but we won't try to settle that issue uh, today. There is no question that New York City is one of the great cities of human civilization, perhaps the greatest city in the history of the world. For this uh, school of government, <laughs> That's an, that's an analytical statement. I'm unbiased. Uh, for this school of government, it's a laboratory as well. Many of our students have uh, studied cases here from Robert Moses and the massive achievement in infrastructure that holds New York together, to Ellen Schall and Rose Washington and the reform of the city's juvenile detention centers. Many of our graduates are now in the city helping to solve some of its more intractable problems. We're grateful to the Student Activities Committee of the Institute of Politics, the Taubman Center for State and Local Government, and the Kennedy Student School Student Caucuses for arranging for us this afternoon the privilege to learn from the person who leads all of these efforts in New York. Consider what Mr. Dinkins manages. A population of about 8 million people, a cacophony of racial, political, and religious diversity an annual budget on the order of $30 billion, a budget that has shrunk by about $7 billion in recent years, an organization of more than a quarter of a million employees working in more than 40 city agencies. Born in Trenton, New Jersey, and raised in Trenton, New York, Mayor Dinkins graduated from Howard University with a degree in mathematics and subsequently from Brooklyn Law School. He began his career in public service as a state assemblyman in 1966. He helped create an innovative program to provide low-income students with opportunities for higher education. He served as president of the Board of Elections, where he is credited with markedly increasing voter registration. He was city clerk for a decade before being elected Manhattan Borough President in 1985. As mayor of New York, he is a nationally recognized champion of programs for those most in need. He's taken on some of the toughest problems facing our society, including homelessness, AIDS, infant mortality, child welfare, housing, education, and racial harmony. Despite having to address these challenges in the context of declining resources, he's managed to close the budget gap without damage to New York City's favorable credit rating, a remarkable accomplishment to those of us who view the situation in Massachusetts. It's my honor to introduce the person with either the first or second most important job in the United States. Uh, this audience may have difficulty believing that the presidency of Harvard is not the first <laughs> most important job. The mayor of New York, his honor, Mr. David Dink. Seven and 34. Uh, I have two grandchildren, uh, Jamal, who's five, and Kalila, who is 18 months. You know, I was uh, swearing in the commissioner of the Human Resource Administration in New York, uh, oh, about a year ago, I guess now. Uh, Barbara Sable, remarkable, special woman. And uh, as I was speaking, uh, 
a child started to cry and the uh, person holding the child got up to leave. I said, no, don't, don't go. That's background music. So he came and sat back down. And uh, when I concluded, then I uh, did the induction. I swore her in. And then Barbara started to speak. The child started to cry. It developed that was her grandchild. She said, I don't need any background music. <laughs> But I love children. You know, I cannot help but, uh, but as I look around and I, I realize I'm aware that uh, a couple of very special people here, so I've got to tell you a story uh, that I sometimes tell. Some of you may have heard this. It's a story of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Did anybody hear from Pennsylvania? You know there is a place called Johnstown, and you are familiar with the fact that anybody from Pennsylvania here? Yeah. All right. You know, you know that in 1889 there was a mighty Johnstown flood, right? I'm not making this up. And uh, there was a dam above the town, and this dam gave way, and waters came down 10, 20, 30 feet high, washed away. A lot of people lost their lives, and there was this wooden railroad trestle. And the people clung to this trestle. Some of them thought they might be thereby saved, but debris piled up around the trestle. Friction caused a fire, and they too perished. So as you can see, this... Mighty Johnstown flood was a tragedy of immense proportion. Well, there was a man that survived all this, lived to be 105. And when he died, he went to heaven, and he found out that in heaven it was the custom that when your turn came, you'd come forward and tell of a momentous event in your life. And he was confident that in seconds he'd become a celebrity in heaven, for after all, he'd survived the mighty Johnstown flood, this tragedy of immense proportion. Finally, his turn came, and... He strode down the center aisle toward the lectern, knowing he'd be a celebrity, for after all, he'd survived the mighty Johnstown flood, this tragedy of immense proportion. <laughs> An angel reached out and touched him on the shoulder and said, I think you should know that Noah is in the audience. <laughs> so, so, you all need to know that, that Dow Forsyth, who is the uh, formerly the secretary to the governor of the state of New York is, is in this audience. And, and Oliver Capel, a distinguished legislator in our assembly in New York, in the audience, to say nothing of all the rest of you experts. So with, with, uh, with that, you will understand I have some trepidation as I go forth. I thank you, uh, Albert Carnesale, for your generous, overly generous introduction and your thoughtful stewardship at the Kennedy School is an inspiration to all who come here to dedicate themselves to public service. Good afternoon, all. I'm grateful for the generous forum you've provided me with today. I, I got to say that when I came in, and I, I was told there were a lot of people here, and I looked around, I saw all these people. I said, gee, I wonder who they expected. You, you, you <laughs> expecting someone else. And, I, and I, I know, and I get the benefit of the, whoever was going to speak. Uh, <laughs> I must say that there are few topics to which I am more committed or about which I am more concerned than the state of our cities. As mayor of, of almost 8 million people, and that's how many I say we have, uh, the, I don't care what the census folks say, they, we, we have a disagreement about that. But I do believe that our city is also one of the greatest urban centers in the world and also one of the most threatened urban centers in our country. And I'm chiefly responsible for what President George Bush has kindly referred to as that domestic stuff. <laughs> to me, that domestic stuff equals the lives and welfare of each of our citizens. Where will they sleep? Will infants be born undernourished? Will children have enough to eat? Will we be able to nurture minds that can produce the great ideas needed for the next century? I'm deeply troubled by the lack of answers to these questions in Washington. Our mayors and governors have been left with a tremendous burden, and we cannot solve these problems alone. And if our president continues to be more interested in foreign policy than in our own state of affairs, he will soon discover, as foreign affairs editor William Hyland recently stated, the enemy is not at the gate but may already be inside. May I say at the onset that the federal government's current disinterest in, if not downright disdain for our cities, is not new. Indeed, anti-urbanism has been with us since the birth of our great democracy. Some of our country's most famous philosophers and writers have quite simply preferred the forests to the streets. Although Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence in a room 
at the corner of Market and 7th Streets in Philadelphia and sent it to be printed in Baltimore where the Continental Congress sat in session. Even this great democratic leader gave us a good dose of anti-urbanism. At the age of 80, Jefferson still held true to his notion that agrarian democracy was a purest democracy. He wrote from Monticello that New York, like London, seems to have all the depravities of human nature. Philadelphia doubtless has its share. Here on the contrary, he continues, crime is scarcely heard of. Breaches of order rare, and our societies, if not refined, are rational, moral, and affectionate at least. So said he. Our agrarian tradition stood in opposition to the European ideal. Our European neighbors praised their cities and called them divine, for the ancient Greeks believed deeply in their cities and their passion has left its mark on our pattern of thought and on the language we speak. Without the spark provided by cities, the torch of human civilization stands as a dry sheath. It is not by accident that we call the period between the decline of ancient urban centers and the rise of medieval western cities the Dark Ages. When Athens and Rome collapsed, so did the West. When cities rose again, Paris and Prague, London and Lyon, Freiburg and Florence, so did the West emerge from rustic feudalism and blossom anew with a million ideas and a bursting ambition to see beyond the horizon. Medieval Germans used to say that city air makes men free. And indeed, it was in cities that democracy evolved and from them that it spread throughout the world. From Paris and the French Revolution of 1789 to Prague and the Velvet Revolution of the 1989, cities have called their nations forth to the great work of freedom. Our Euro European friends understand that cities have been the key to modernity that cities serve as our commercial and intellectual marketplaces where economies and philosophy, entertainment and art, science and technology, ideas and emotions flourish and enrich our experience. Yet in this country, even as our cities led the way to freedom and democracy, still they were viewed with suspicion. We moved our state capitals to the countryside and the mobs of great cities, Jefferson told us, added to the support of pure government as sores due to the strength of the human body. Indeed, since our 19th century debate over who should build roads and canals in the West, the demand for federal involvement in cities has most often met a deaf ear. The first direct grants to cities did not even appear until 1940, and a federal amnesia has erased the fact that cities have made neighboring regions economically sound. Nations have always depended on cities to yield up more in taxes than these same cities have gotten back in federal goods and services. Economists have pointed out that when the first federal income tax was imposed in 1913, New York State supplied the nation with one-third of the tax yield. Let me say that again. <laughs> New York supplied the nation with one-third of the tax yield, and most of that income came from New York City. Like a mighty engine, urban America pulls all of America into the future. Seventy-seven million Americans, almost one-third of our population, live within the limits of our cities. And corporate America lives in our cities as well. For all the growth of suburban office parks and shopping malls, no major bank or insurance company, no leading law firm or hospital would be at home outside of our cities. Our ballet companies and museums, theaters and sports teams, and our great halls of education, Harvard and Berkeley, Chicago, Columbia, and, and CUNY, all depend on urban centers. So while our recent federal abandonment of urban poor never made sense in our hearts, we all understood that ketchup wasn't really a vegetable to put on children's plates. <laughs> How could it ever have made any economic sense? For the federal government's abandonment of its cities really meant an abandonment of the entire country. Since the 1980s, cities have been the acrobats of a federal circus. Ronald Reagan's new federalism left cities to fend for themselves and created a very short-lived illusion that supply-side economics was something other than voodoo economics. But slowly and painfully, we all witnessed the consequences of that federal abandonment that we had anticipated all along. Homelessness spread across the country. Steel workers lost their jobs with each flip of the calendar day. 
and the life expectancy for a young man in Harlem grew shorter than the life expectancy for his peer in Bangladesh. We created wealth and we wasted it. While money went into the Star Wars research and the defense budget, it never made it into our cities. If the federal government had maintained the level of aid it gave New York City 10 years ago, our operating budget would have received an additional $1.2 billion this year. Moreover, another $2.5 billion in housing money would have enriched our capital construction program in this year alone. When you figure the size of the budget gaps that I've had to fill since I've been mayor, some $8 billion, you can appreciate what this kind of money means. And I was giving you just the annual figures just now. In the last decade, federal discretionary aid to states and localities was cut in half from $50 billion in 1978 to $25 billion in 1989. Community development block grants, employment and training, and mass transit aid, the funding required for economic development and growth were virtually cut in half. In Europe, the essential threads of the social safety net, education for the young, Health care for the old and sick are paid for by the national government. But our federal government has shifted the tax burden to the states and local governments, leaving us with an enormous hole to fill. While in a months-long debate last year, it argued over whether taxes should be raised by a small percentage for the richest members of this country. These were Washington's choices. At the beginning of the Reagan administration, the federal government spent only $7 on defense for every dollar it spent on housing. Now, that ratio has skyrocketed to $46 spent on defense for every dollar spent on housing. And while our president has wisely chosen to reduce nuclear arms, he still has not provided the necessary peace dividend to aid our damaged cities. Indeed, Defense Secretary Richard Cheney has already announced that the cuts in nuclear weapons will actually cost us more money in the short term. We must stop this redlining of American cities by the federal government. We need a new American order, which means a leadership that cares about rebuilding New York and Detroit and small, low-income cities like Chelsea, Massachusetts, at least as much as it cares about rebuilding Kuwait City. Our lawmakers in Washington must realize that the enemy is within our own sight. They must address this strange notion that our national security, foreign policy ambitions, and domestic needs are somehow unrelated. I hope that our lawmakers will respond to the conclusion of Dr. William W. Kaufman, who joined us earlier today, that we can safely reduce defense spending by 50 percent over the next 10 years. And we need to consider legislation such as Senator Tom Harkin's proposal to transfer $3 billion from our defense budget to domestic programs. Another interesting proposal is that of Senator Bill Bradley, who is suggesting the reallocation of money earmarked for military and domestic programs. The senator advocates putting these dollars directly into the pockets of Americans in the form of a $350 tax credit for every dependent child. We are now at a critical juncture. We must begin to see our cities as part of a larger global society. From the Industrial Revolution to World War II, the United States has had to compete internationally. But today, we are slipping into technological backwardness. While we're eliminating trains throughout our country, Japan is building a superconductive model that will soar 325 miles in an hour flat. And of the seven leading industrial nations in the world, Japan and Germany invest the most in human and physical infrastructure, while the United States invests the least. Is it any wonder that there has been so much talk lately of our economic decline? Historically, our cities have served our regions, from the creation of handcrafted objects to the production of manufactured goods. If we are to survive in the 21st century, we must develop another precious commodity. We must produce the great ideas that will continue to keep this country a superpower. We must reinvest in our schools, in our universities, and in our communications networks. Right now, according to the Federal Department of Education, our students rank behind Korea. United Kingdom, Canada, and Spain in science proficiency of 13-year-olds. We must create an environment in which ideas can germinate, an environment that will lead the way to new technology. Unless our great cities prosper, unless we become cities that fully participate in a global society,
the American civilization that inspired a whole world of freedom will itself begin to decline. As Professor Robert Reich has pointed out, our nation's future economic success depends not on national borders. In fact, he argues, such borders will cease to exist in a new global economy, but on the unique attributes of our citizens and on the skills and insights of our workforce. And it is within our cities, as it has been since the dawn of civilization, in Egypt, Athens, and Rome, where these great ideas will be born. If we cannot train Americans for the emerging global economy, then we must be prepared to take a back seat and give up our role as a superpower. Last fall, in an attempt to better prepare our cities for the singular challenges and demands of the next century, we held in New York City what we called an urban summit. Thirty-five mayors from around the, the country, major cities representing some 26 million people, cities like Chicago and Philadelphia and Boston and Cleveland and San Francisco and Los Angeles, we came together uh, and we produced a, a, an agenda. We called it a, an urban compact and gave it a title, In the National Interest. It's since been adopted by the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities. At the heart of our agenda is a recognition that no matter how hard we work, no matter how creative we are, we desperately need more resources to complete the job. Last May, our Urban Summit mayors held a meeting with congressional leaders in Washington to call for emergency anti-recessionary legislative aid to our cities. First, we must address the effects of our country's downward economic spiral and provide relief for our citizens with anti-recessionary legislation. We're asking that Congress appropriate an additional $2 billion for the Community Development Block Grant Program to be distributed to those cities that meet at least one of two criteria. They are cities that have experienced a loss of jobs for two consecutive calendar quarters, or cities that have an, have an unemployment rate of more than 7%. Second, we must invest in roads, bridges, and indeed the entire transportation network, delivering goods and services to our people that has been the underpinning of our prosperity. We urge Congress to enact promptly an expanded Surface Transportation Act. Third, we must invest in our families and our children by providing them with decent housing, health care, and education. We support making Head Start an entitlement, thus allow allowing every child in this country access to this proven successful program to prepare children for their education. Seems to me that, that we as a society, if we fail to understand that our future is in our young, we don't understand anything. Old folks like me are going to be gone one day, and in some cases, not too soon, not, not too, too long from now. Uh, I hope to be around, I hope to be around a bit longer. But it's true, and, and we, we adults, we hold our cities and states, indeed the nation and the planet in trust for the young and those not yet born. And it just is illogical, it is irrational not to provide for the young. Separate and apart from humane considerations, just makes no sense. So we also support the Urban Schools of America Act, or USA Act, that would target resources to local educational agencies serving urban areas. These are only some of the programs that we're advocating now. If you ask me where we're going to get the money, then I will tell you that the federal government has plenty of money. The federal government came up with $500 billion to bail out the corrupt bankers who milked our savings and loan industry while turning its back on the men and women in all of our cities who want a decent education for their children and who can't afford warm clothes and a hot meal for their families. As mayor of one of the largest cities in this country, I can speak firsthand to the stress that has afflicted our citizens who struggle to earn enough money to pay the rent or to buy a home. The stress is great and it's taken its most immediate form in a monstrous body we know as racism. In these exceedingly difficult times, we're all searching for a piece of the pie, and the most frightened mistakenly believe that something is being taken away from them. These people, and I believe that it is only a small group of people, threatened by the differences of their neighbors, react by lashing out. In cities as in nations, in Croatia and in Crown Heights, diversity is tested by poverty and by fear. 
We must begin to understand that if our brothers and sisters thrive, then we too will thrive. As I speak, America is undergoing its greatest ethnic and cultural change since the turn of the century. According to the 1990 census, the majority of residents in New York metropolitan area is composed of minority people. We have now reached a so-called minority majority, helping to ensure that we are the most diverse cosmopolitan city in the world. You know, in the city of New York, we have more than 170 separate ethnic identities. By the year 2000, people of color will comprise the majority of the workforce in Los Angeles. Miami has become a Hispanic city. Milwaukee has seen a revival of its Polish neighborhoods, and Lowell, Massachusetts now has the second largest Cambodian community in our country. It is this great mixture of ethnic and social identities learning to live together that makes our cities the places where ideas are born and democracy flourishes. The 10 largest metropolitan areas, which account for nearly 20% of our country's population, welcome more than half the immigrants who came here in 1989. Yet at the same time, federal support had evaporated almost entirely. To win our cause and to halt the destruction of our cities, urban leaders must band together into the largest lobbying effort Washington has ever seen. In the words of John F. Kennedy, united there is little we cannot do in, in a host of new cooperative ventures. Divided there is little we can do, for we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. We must bring urban affairs back to the top of the list of priorities of both our state and federal governments. And we must do it with the commitment and dedication of a people who know that their future will be darkened if we accept the loss of our radiant cities. The questions facing us are clear. Can we educate our people well, allowing them to develop into whole, thoughtful human beings? Can people of different racial, ethnic, and religious backgrounds and different sexual orientations live together, understand one another, and become a community of hands that build? Can we enter the next century as the leaders of freedom and of democracy who will nurture and enable all of our citizens to prosper in this great land? I know that the answer is yes. Our federal government has a moral obligation to aid the cities that add so much to the economic and cultural life of this country. I believe that we, a community of educators, legislators, and students of government, can lay the groundwork to reach our goal, a national urban agenda to reshape our cities and our society. I have the utmost faith that with people like you, we will create a society in which all of our residents can share its joys, a society in which our diversity will be our very strength. I thank you for being such a courteous audience. God bless you all. Keep the faith. We have such a, we have such a question. Yeah. We've got a lot of time. enough to uh, agree to take some questions from the audience. We have a microphone here and here, and two microphones up there. It would be most helpful if you would get by the microphones. Please try to make the questions brief so we can give as many people an opportunity as possible. So. Right here. Uh, Your Honor? Yes, sir. I'm uh, from the city of Jersey City, and I've worked for the city of Jersey City. And as you've known, there's been a little tension between the two cities in terms of attracting investment. And uh, it's, the situation is that uh, we've, the, the two cities have always been uh, arguing over things as the Statue of Liberty, NBC, and the Commodities Exchange. And uh, I'm just asking, is what can we the still two have, we, still have, uh, we still have the Statue of Liberty, and yeah. we still have, <laughs> we still have the uh, Commodities Exchange. Uh, we have Merrill Lynch, so. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hear what you said, but. <laughs> But uh, what I ask you is, uh, how can the two cities work better? Because in a lot of situations, the private sector is using the two cities to try and get better tax rates and abatements from each other without ever right. really intending to move. Your, your question is an excellent one, and you're right. 
there has been that kind of competition. And, and what we have done in New York, uh, I can say that Governor Mario Cuomo has been supportive of this effort. Uh, what, what we have done in, is to say to the surrounding area, we, we, are, we in a region need one another. And while we should compete on occasion, it's important for us not to let uh, the by getting us in a bidding contest, wherein they know that whatever one bids, the other's got to bid a dollar more. And so the, the uh, Deputy Mayor for Finance and Economic Development in New York, a dynamic woman, happens to be Puerto Rican, whose name is Sally Hernandez Panero, is uh, uh, on top of that case. And so we work at that. And even as we go elsewhere in the in the country, and we're also looking at the international situation, but as we go elsewhere, we don't go to, to other cities and say, uh, why don't you move to New York? We say, if you're thinking of expanding, think of New York. And we think it is a, a, a in the fashion that, that has sometimes been the case, ends up costing everybody money. Thank you very much for your question. Take one right here. Mayor, good afternoon. My name is Nelson Rineri. I'm a member of the Hispanic Caucus here at the Kennedy School. And on behalf of the caucus, we want to extend to you a most heartfelt and sincere welcome. Thank you. And we're very happy that you touched upon the issues of race in your discussion. We'd like to, our question to you specifically is, do you think it's fair to characterize race relations in your city, in our nation, as being at a very bad point, maybe the lowest point? And specifically, what is the administration, your administration, doing to remedy that? And finally, in terms of the definition of race relations. How could you characterize what would be uh, a positive race, rela positive race relations and maybe an acceptable level of racial tension? Well, I don't think that uh, we're at the lowest point, so-called. We, we in New York, New York City, for instance, because we are a media capital, uh, if anything at all happens in New York, it goes around the world instantly, you know, CNN and C-SPAN, whatever, but people really know. I, because we have the United Nations in New York and I get visits from people from around the world at, at Gracie Mansion where the mayor lives and, and at City Hall, and I'm amazed uh, often at the familiarity of the visitors with what has gone on. Uh, and, and, and so when something happens, if we have two folks fighting over parking space now, I, I don't know whether you have the problem of finding parking spaces in Boston that we have in, the, in, in the <coughs> New York City, but uh, certainly in, in Midtown Manhattan, you can have two folks that, that arrive simultaneously for that spot, and, and the emotions can rise. And if it should develop that they're of different ethnic backgrounds, somebody will call that a racial incident, and not necessarily so. And we do have genuine racial incidents, to be sure, and we have them in New York. We have a very serious situation very recently, as I, you doubtless know, in the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn uh, involving uh, the uh, Hasidim and, and African Americans, a uh, very serious situation, which uh, I think we've got the lid on and we're working very hard at curing. It's important to, to under, for people to understand in that particular case, you. You have each side feeling that the other is uh, getting preferential treatment, and it is not not easy to to uh, to deal with. Then you have some who don't want a resolution, who very purposely uh, try to stir up uh, problems and difficulties. What we have done in that regard in New York City, uh, in addition to the things that have been going on all along, people out in the street. Uh, the, uh, there was some mention made of Rose Washington a while ago. I think in your introduction to me, Rose heads up our juvenile justice, and Rose was out in the street with me, with with uh, Dennis De Leon, who heads up our uh, city uh, commissioner of human rights, a uh, fellow named Michael Carfin, who works under Bill Lynch, a deputy mayor, and handles what we call our community assistance unit, and a whole lot of others. Catherine Abadi from probation walking out in the streets, talking to young people and whatnot, trying to calm, calm them, some of them with legitimate grievances as they saw it, not necessarily directed at the Jewish community, just mad in general. And, uh, and, and you have to try to explain to folks like that that uh, 
you may have a legitimate gripe, but violence is not the answer to it. And as I say to them on a day like today, and the sun is shining and the sky is blue and you're 15 to 20 years old, you've got, who knows, medical technology being what it is, 80, 90, 100 years to live. You can't blow it behind this. Or as I said to one young man who was very angry and, and had an attitude of, I'm ready to die. And I said, but he had two children, ages one and two. I said, well, fine, but your wife will be husbandless and your children will have no father. Is this really the answer? And we get to work at it. Uh, and uh, and there's, there's enough blame to go around all over the place. But we're working very hard at it. And one thing we've done very recently is to, we had a day-long forum <coughs> on racial harmony. And the governor participated in it, helped us kick it off in the morning. And there were about four separate segments, uh, looking historically at what has been uh, one section where we had just young people saying what they thought and what they wanted, and then ultimately uh, uh, some suggestions about solutions. And from this, uh, or at this time at least, I announced the formation of what we call a, a, an Increase the Peace Corps. We've been using the slogan, Increase the Peace. So we decided that we wanted to have an Increase the Peace Corps, <clears throat> a thousand volunteers who will be trained in conflict resolution and how to cut bureaucratic red tape uh, so that, that hopefully they can be on the scene some of these times when problems are about to burst forth and, and can, can cool it out. Uh, this is being, uh, this, this day-long forum was funded and hosted by the, uh, Sir Robert Maxwell, of uh, the new owner and publisher of the Daily News, and we estimate our budget for the first year of this operation of this increase the Peace Corps at $750,000, which they are covering. Uh, in subsequent years, the city will pick up half the cost and, uh, and they'll pay the other. This is not the whole answer by any means, but it is a start. It is amazing what can be accomplished by people saying please and thank you. And, 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 and just you know, to walk around angry all the time hurts and costs more. It doesn't mean that the problems ought not be addressed because they must be. But we've got to identify the real enemy and frequently it is not each other. And, uh, and that, that's one of the reasons I, I don't lay all of this at the, the, the feet of, of Washington to be sure. Because we had racial strife in times of plenty. Uh, people had a lot and wanted more. Uh, but, but I do know that when, when, when you have ever shrinking resources, uh, it's difficult. Long time ago, I practiced law, and you have a loving family, and then the breadwinner would die. Boy, I got to tell you, you know, they, they're very difficult sometimes. So uh, we are working very hard at the whole racial thing, as we must, because we are a city of immigrants, as indeed this land is a land of immigrants. Everybody, save the American Indian, was already here. Uh, and then those of us who came in slave ships in chains. But everybody else came seeking freedom of, of, of some form of oppression. And, and we're a land of immigrants, and new waves are coming every day. And we've got to learn, uh, those of us who are already here and doing well, we've got to learn to open our arms and greet those coming in. And, and, and we have to strive to understand the backgrounds and heritages of other peoples. Uh, the way I phrase it is, so as to come to love one another, but if, if not that, at least to respect one another. Because if we can respect one another and the rights of other peoples, then we've come a long way. And we adults have to, to be role models for our little ones uh, in that fashion. Little kids are not born bigoted. They did not. They learn it from us. And so we've got to teach them differently, and we do much of it, and we can do much of it by example. Thank you. But thank you, and thank you for your, your, your welcome. I appreciate it. Uh, your Honor, um, one issue which you did not mention specifically in your speech, but I'm sure is a major concern of yours, is the drug problem, which is very big in New York City and, of course, all cities across the country, this one being no exception. Um, uh, David Conliffe and your Office of Drug Abuse Policy have been doing a remarkable job under limited circumstances, limited by the uh, federal government's uh, allocating 70% of all anti-drug resources to interdiction and only 30 for uh, treatment and prevention. 
And also when New York City usually gets money, it's like the Target Cities grant is for improving existing treatment slots rather than expanding the options available. Uh, what is your, your quote-unquote wish list from Bob Martinez's office and the federal government, and how much do you think the feds can improve the uh, plight of, of drug abuse in cities? Well, I, uh, I thank you for your compliment about David Conliff, uh, Do Dr. Conliff. See, I don't have a PhD, so if folks have one, I'd like to mention it. Doc Doc Dr. Conliff is doing a great job. He is a bright young man and very committed and dedicated. Uh, I agree with you. We, the prop, that is a large measure of the problem is the, the percentage of the resources that go into interdiction uh, in, in, a, in a war that's not even a good battle. Uh, I think we need to be spending uh, much more money in treatment uh, and education because we, we have a limited capacity to, to uh, stop the supply although I need, think we need to work at it, you know, just open the doors. Uh, we have a limited capacity, but we do have the capacity to, to uh, uh, curb those who use drugs uh, through education and some who are currently addicted to get them off drugs. I don't mean that the rate, uh, the, the, the uh, success rate will be 100% by no means, but it, it will be something. And every time you save a single soul, uh, aside from the humane consideration, which obviously means a lot, you know, otherwise you got a wasted person, uh, but you also have somebody who will contribute to the tax base instead of being a drain on it. And uh, so I, I favor this. Uh, the uh, former drug czar, uh, what's his name, you know, Bennett. Bennett, Bennett said, some reason why I couldn't recall his name, uh, Bennett, <laughs> Bennett, Bennett said, um, he, he ran around the country checking him out and reached a conclusion there wasn't much we could do with treatment. That was the conclusion he reached and I think he was dead wrong. So then he sort of declared victory and, and, and retired. Uh, and I, I, think he, I think he was dead wrong. Um, and uh, I, I, I believe there are things we can do. There are programs that are working. Uh, you know, there, there, we have some in New York, uh, uh, Phoenix House, Phoenix Academy. I mean, they, they, you see, you, you know people on a first-hand basis, productive citizens who had been addicts. Some celebrities we know who today are productive people. We can't just let them go and waste them. And uh, so it's a, uh, and those, as you know, there, there's a body of thought that says let's legalize drugs. And, and some very bright, caring people through frustration have said let's legalize drugs and thereby you, 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 know, you reduce the, the profit and therefore and so forth. And I don't buy that at all. I resist it greatly. Uh, I think they're dead wrong. Your Honor, it's a pleasure to see you. My name is Howard Spamber from Bayside, Queens. Uh -huh. And um, so my question is picking up on the question asked before here, but specifically about the growing schism between African Americans and Jews in New York. You ran as a fusion candidate, one who could restore goodwill in a city that growing and growing uh, controversies between African-Americans and Jews. And your efforts have largely been greeted, not by a majority of New Yorkers, but by demagogues on both sides of this, you can call them sides, with vitriolic insults. Um, one person saying you have too many yarmulkes on your head, another person calling you a fancy schwatzer with a mustache. Is it possible in New York to have a, a candidate, a politician, calling for fusion and have it work, or is it always going to polarize? Well, it, it worked for me. Now, uh, the the uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> no. The uh, the some of the comments that you made, the uh, uh, fancy swasher with a mustache, that was uh, Jackie Mason right. during the general election. Right. Uh, and frankly, that was just Jackie being Jackie. It, it didn't, you know, it wasn't. He didn't really mean it. In a, you know, as a racial comment. That's just the way he is. He talks that way. Uh, the, uh, the, fella, the fella said I wore too many yarmulkes. C. Was, Mason. 
was it was either I'm gonna say it was either Vernon or, or Alton Maddox and one of them and Vernon Vernon and Vernon said that uh, I forget it specifically what in point in time but it was where he disagreed with something it may have been I really don't remember the specific but it may have been when I went I went to Israel when the missiles were falling there so some African Americans didn't like that I said I was going to South Africa as I am going to go in November come hell or high water and and some some folks don't like that uh, Senator D'Amato has suggested that maybe I ought to stay there if I go but uh, but I got elected I got elected with with a a coalition it is not possible in the city of many other places too but in the city of New York it is not possible for a person to be elected uh, without a coalition. There are not enough African Americans, assuming all of them would vote for you, uh, or not enough Jews, assuming they all of them would vote for you, et cetera, it, or, or all the Puerto Ricans, or all the, it, not possible. You've got to put together a coalition. Now, and I did that, and I succeeded. People said we would not succeed, but we did. Now, uh, in come 93, I'm going to run again. I've already said I'm going to run again, and, and, uh, We'll see what the outcome is. But with respect to, to uh, uh, let's take this recent situation in Crown Heights. Uh, I got a letter of congratulations from Teddy Collick, for instance. As you all know, the mayor of Jerusalem. He and I are friends. He wrote me thanking me for calling him because he had been ill. And I called him to, to wish him well and whatnot. So he, he re responded with a letter. And in the, in the letter, he said, I think you're doing a great job in Crown Heights. Uh, I got a letter from, a, a handwritten note from Felix Rowan. Uh, you all know who he is. Uh, unsolicited, saying on strictly the subject of Crown Heights, saying that he thought I was doing a good job. Henry Siegman of the uh, American Jewish Congress the other day put out a, a statement critical of D'Amato and praising me for what I've done. I have a lot of letters of commendation and, and calls and whatnot, and some editorial comment along those lines. On the other hand, I got some African Americans who say that I have been giving preferential treatment to, to Jews. Uh, I have some Jews who are saying that I held back the police on the, the first couple of days. Untrue. Police commissioners denied it. First deputy police commissioners denied it. The chief of, of the department has denied it. Chief of patrol, the borough commander. Not, not Dinkins, nor anyone in City Hall, n with or without authority. Nobody said, hold it. Um, and, uh, but yet, uh, there's some who believe that. It's not true. Uh, I think that by and large, though, uh, folks understand that, that I am a fair person. They may not agree with every judgment I make, but, but I'm one with respect to the Jewish community, for instance, that... Uh, as far back as, as when they came with the resolution on Zionism, which the, thank God the president now has, has called uh, for <coughs> its repeal, uh, I, along with Baird Rusted and others, joined in a full-page ad in the New York Times, formed an organization called Black Americans in Support of Israel Committee, on specifically that point. There were friends of mine who were African Americans who who denounced me because I stood alone and said that I thought the things that Farrakhan was saying was wrong. So I got, I, I got a lot of people condemn me on either side or all sides. But I say to my friends who are Jewish, they ought not let white, the rest of white America get away with pretending that whatever difficulties exist are between African Americans and Jews. Because that's not the case. There is racism abroad in the land. And, and, and African Americans are ill-treated. Others are ill-treated too. There's anti-Semitism. There are people, a homophobia. There are people who don't like the disabled. And incidentally, I, I wear this pen always to, to remind me some of us are disabled and the rest of us are temporarily able-bodied. It's important that <laughs> folks to remember that. So I, I believe that, that uh, uh, most people are fair-minded people and good people. There's some people will seize upon racial strife for their own ends and seek to stir it up and keep it hot. And, uh, but we work very hard at, at curbing that. And uh, I'm confident that in the long run, we will prevail.
I can follow up with just yes, an empirical sure. question. Let, no, let, Very I mean, short. I, I may not have answered okay. his question. I want to. No, I, I don't dispute that um, you were successful in winning an election. I hope you can win the next one doing the same thing. Um, but winning elections doesn't necessarily, well, mean, mean effectiveness, as Bush has proved. Um, <laughs> I, but you're, but you're not, but you're yeah, not making question, a comparison, though. I, I think, um, I, I agree with your policies. I think you're doing an effective job. But do you dispute that the extremes that you're talking about of these two groups, the demagogues, are not growing the size of them? Well, I mean, I, I think it's hard, it's, hard to it's hard to tell. I mean, I'll tell you what I do know. I don't know that there are more of them. I'm not so sure that that's true. But for damn sure, the media determines where to focus. And if the media decides to focus, listen, if I can get the media, instead of focusing on certain folks that I know, in the African-American community, for instance, if I can get them to focus on a fellow named Richard Green. Richard Green wears his hair in dreadlocks, wears his hair in dreadlocks, wears more often than not sort of a dungarees or, or fatigues, uh, 14 years in Crown Heights out in the street with 6,000 youngsters bringing them along two master's degrees and a four-year veteran of the Marine Corps. Now there's a role model. And I try to get the media to focus on him instead of on somebody who's denouncing somebody and yelling some racial slur. And, uh, and, and they're more like him. And that's part of the, this whole increase the Peace Corps effort to get as many Richard Green. See, leaders, in my mind, a leader is anybody who can influence two and a half more people. If, if you're super in a building, you got six apartments, you're a leader. If you're a block association. Leaders are not just those of us who get elected. And leaders are not just members of the clergy or business people who are wealthy. Leaders are, are anybody who will follow us or get somebody to follow them. And what we need to do collectively is, is to get the media to focus on some, quote, other leaders. And there are a lot of them out there, good people. Incidentally, a lot of folks who are good are silent. We, we've had that. A lot of people are silent, so sometimes they need a little encouragement. So they, you know, so I'm not everybody's willing to stand alone. I, I've done it, and it's it's not always pleasant. Thank you. I better. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, one of the privileges of this job is we get to introduce people like you. One of the burdens is have to end the questions when we run out of time. But on behalf of uh, everybody here in this community. He's really got to go, uh, Your Honor. Can I stay in our honor? You can do whatever you want. Could I just? But they're going to be very unhappy. <laughs> let me. Uh, I, let me tell you why I have to leave, and maybe I could take like a couple more. The reason I have to leave is is Ray Flynn and I are speaking at a a uh, fundraising reception for John Bullard, and 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 then I got to be on, at the airport on a plane at seven. <clears throat> got to going to Washington. So, but, but that's, that's why, but... Mayor, Mayor, up, here, up or left? Oh, Mayor up Dinkins. top, she's saying. Mayor, Mayor Dinkins. Okay. This guy has been waiting right up there. I, you gotta forgive me, I can't even see up okay, there. Okay, right there. He's been waiting uh, long and patiently. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, Mayor... Oh. <laughs> Mayor Dinkins, uh, this past summer you've indicated your concern over the continued hydroelectric development going on at James Bay the promises to displace thousands of native peoples and destroy miles of wilderness on behalf of New York and New England power needs. Uh, this past week you met with Cree Chief Matthew Kuhnkum. I was wondering if you could tell us what you talked about with Mr. Kuhnkum and, and further to elaborate a little bit on what is becoming an increasingly important issue at regional and national uh, politics, that is energy. Well, we, we are, uh, as, you, as you, well, first of all, when I met with him, it was supposed to be a a, uh, a courtesy call uh, because he was a chief of a nation, Cree nation, and it was a courtesy call at, at City Hall, just like I, I've uh, received uh, from President Aristide, for instance, the other day, and, and saw him just the other day, and I hope that he's restored to power in, uh, in Haiti. But uh, so it was supposed to be just a courtesy call, and you know, photographs and sign a guest book and exchange gifts and sort of like that. And uh, he, he pleaded his case. So my staff said, well, that wasn't supposed to be. I said, look, I don't blame him. When you get in the door, take your best shot. And, uh, and, but I have, uh, long before I met him, um, and Senator Franz Leichter uh, of our 
state senate brought him in. But long before I met him, though, I had written to the state uh, ur urging that, that uh, we we uh, uh, examine that and re-examine that. And I am most sympathetic. There, there, there are there's the con environmental concerns, yeah. and and then concerns obviously for the Cree nation that they be displaced. So I'm. I, we have not made a firm judgment are, yet, but I'm certainly favorably disposed. Are you, are you willing to take a leadership no, no role? No follow-up. I think, uh, we got one right there. Right. right. My name is Sylvia Trujillo, and my question is, since you've em emphasized the importance of education, are you concerned that faculties at universities like Harvard, Columbia, and Princeton overwhelmingly are populated by white males, and these men are preparing the leaders of a population that is increasingly diverse and multicultural. Yes. 